So yeah, hi. Um, my name is James Woodrow, otherwise known as Woody. I am from Indie Studio Utopia World of Sandwiches, and this is going to be a look at what happened with our most recent game, Chompy Chomp Chomp Party on the Wii U. So I am the only full-time employee of Utopia World of Sandwiches. However, we are a husband and wife team. Um, we come up with the game designs together, but mainly I do everything. Hence the job title I've given myself of CFEO, which is the chief fucking everything officer. Um, and my wife is the CEEO, which is the uh, chief everything else officer. So, a bit of background before I get to uh, Chompy Chomp Chomp Party. We started the company in 2011, and by March 2012, we released our first game on Chompy Chomp Chomp on the Xbox 360. Now, there's supposed to be a trailer playing here, but it's not working, so I have to imagine what our first game looks like. Um, we basically felt like there weren't enough games that people could play together in one room. So, that's, we focused on making a small, simple and fun local multiplayer game. Um, kind of in the vein of games like Bomberman and Super Monkey Ball that we had like awesome um, time playing with our friends at university. And we released on Steam in May 2014 after we finally agreed. We decided to make a sequel rather than move straight on to a, a different game because it seemed to make sense. We had a lot of ideas that we hadn't really explored in the first game. And we wanted to try and make it in 3D and use Unity. Um, and we kind of, find, we'd become registered Nintendo developers. So this happened after we met with um, Carl Hilton of he was at Crytek at the time. I think he now heads up Sumo Digital. Uh, that's him there. So he played Chompy Chomp Chomp at an expo, and I sent him a cheeky email because I really like the Wii U was just about to come out, and I wanted to get in touch with Nintendo and get our next game on the Wii U. Um, and he kind of phoned up some of the guys there, and we organised a meeting and developed, and then pretty quickly we were registered developers. We really thought it'd be a perfect fit for Wii U. Um, and then we figured out that we could use a multitude of controllers on the Wii to get up to nine players, and that was it basically. We were definitely going to try and make a nine player local game. Um, and then my wife got pregnant in 2015. So this kind of pushed our release date forward by quite a bit. Um, not entirely planned. The pregnancy was planned, the release date coming forward was not. Um, and it turns out babies have pretty kind of specific deadlines on when they launch, and they're not <laughs> movable at all. So, we started the development of Chompy Chomp Chomp Party, and I think it was autumn of 2014. We eventually released in May of 2016. So the development took us, I think, 91 weeks of my time every day. Um, quite a few late nights. And so, what kind of happened during that time? What did I learn? So on the first day, um, we actually had another member of the team who did most of the coding. So this was actually my first commercial product that I was making pretty much all on my own. And it was the first project I'd made in Unity, so, you know, why not? So I jumped straight in and picked it up fairly quickly because I had done a bit of coding in C-sharp and sort of the interface was familiar enough to like sort of 3D modeling and animation packages that kind of, it didn't seem too hairy. Um, so I got into it pretty quickly. Um, plus the community is so prolific that, you know, if you get anything wrong, you just Google the answer. It's pretty straightforward and then copy paste that's how you make games, right? <laughs> Um, so we made all the graphics using Maya LT, I don't know if you know Maya LT, but it's kind of a cut down version of full Maya, specifically tailored for game creation. Um, for me it was really good because I'm quite familiar with Maya and I've got a good workflow in it, so LT just helped me to kind of you know, make my art quicker, it was one less thing to worry about learning, and it really sped up my pipeline in comparison to using something free like Blender. Um, the other thing we well was the game is inherently modular. We kind of needed it to be. Um, but it meant that we could do as many levels or sort of different game modes as we could fit into the time frame. Um, we managed the game by doing sort of weird one person version of Scrum. So I had this sort of backlog of work, which you can't see too well there. Um, but each task I would assign a number of points. Um, so a one point task would be something simple like maybe one or two lines of code. Every week we would then look at what tasks um, we could fit into that week ahead. And interestingly, sort of looking back on this, this is like my um, velocity chart there. So green is a really good week, so uh, when there was like, about 81 points, and then bad weeks of nothing. I don't know what I was doing that week, but probably not working. But the big green weeks, you can sort of see, like looking back on it was interesting for me, because this is the first time I really looked back on the project and how it all went. And It'd be easy to look at that. So one of the big green ones is there's an expo. So I'm like cramming, I'm doing loads of extra hours, I'm trying to you know, get everything expo ready. 
Um, and it'd be easy to assume that that was the only reason why I did more work. But actually, when you look into the details of it, I did a lot more work that week because it was a lot of smaller tasks. So there's a lot less things to go wrong there. There's a lot of bug fixing, there's a lot of polishing. And they're really quick and easy, so you can hammer through them really fast. So looking forward to our next project, we'll sort of be looking at breaking down the larger tasks that we thought, you know, we don't know how many points there are. We need to try and break those big tasks down to smaller tasks so that we can really estimate our time. Um, but this all made it really easy to kind of know how much time we had left. We could plan for expos really well um, and get our milestones going. And expos are really, really good for playtesting and free QA. It's absolutely made it brilliant. So kind of being able to take the game as a work in progress is really valuable. Um, so things that went wrong. Oh my god, yeah, things did go wrong. Um, <coughs> Dash mode was the first game mode that we previewed that wasn't in the original game. And at first, it seemed to work really well. So the way this works is very much like a, um, if you ever played the playground game Bulldog or something, um, basically one of these players, the yellow guy, is trying to get from one zone to the next. Everyone else is trying to stop him. And if someone stops him, they become the dasher. When we first tested this, it was brutally hard, because you've got eight players trying to get you. People rarely made it from one side to the next. But when they did, everybody loved it. It was just, like such a hard achievement to do that kind of the whole player base was like getting behind them. But the problem with that was not everyone was enjoying that difficulty level, and it meant that people that weren't as highly skilled at the game just didn't have a lot of fun. And for our player base, a lot of them are younger kind of kids and stuff, we had to tone it down. But in toning that game mode down, we really lost something that kind of that really made it fun, and it was, it was difficult. We lost something special. We tweaked it and tweaked and tweaked, um, and eventually we had something that was left. It was okay, but this really feels like one of the weaker game modes um, that made it into the game. And looking back on it, I kind of wish we just cut it like earlier, but we went too far and we had to put it in. And another thing that was kind of it was unavoidable. But when we thought about doing a nine-player game, it was a great idea, but we didn't really think about how complicated that was going to make the interface with all the different kind of weird plugins of controllers that you're going to have with the Wii U, and people like plugging them in mid-game, taking them out mid-game, especially on this screen, it was a bit of a nightmare. So the controller select screen kept crashing throughout the entire development of the game. Um, I fixed the bug at one point, but I, don't, I can't even remember now what it was. It was, just, it was a bane in my head that existed for two years. But we had to just... Um, keep tweaking it. Every time we changed it, it was kind of a big recode. I hate this screen so much, and I just, I never want to touch it again, but I'm going to have to when we move on to new platforms. Um, we estimated that getting through sort of Nintendo's QA on this was going to be about three months, and for the European release it actually was, but the US was a further two months on top of that, and that was annoying because we had this impending baby deadline coming on, it was a long slog, and a lot of people told us it was going to take longer, and I refused to believe them, but they were right. So lessons I learned. I did learn a few things. Always read the marketing guidelines. Now, this is important. I mean, this is something that isn't entirely game dev related, but something you have to do when you're self-publishing and you're an indie. Now, we hired out a studio to film some live action segments for a trailer for our game. And we got about sort of 15 people all together at one time, filmed it all, and then edited it all together, sent off our trailer to Nintendo, and I got an email back, back saying, no, you can't use that. And I was like, well, this has taken like, quite a lot of time, a fair bit of money. Um, and what it was, was none of the people in the video were wearing their wrist straps. So I was like, this ruins everything. I mean, I can't, the deadline was too close, I couldn't reshoot it, I couldn't get everyone back together. Um, so I had to make a call, like, what am I going to do? I want to use the footage. We spent a bit of money on it. Um, so what I did for the next two weeks was I took photos of wrist straps at different angles. I cut them out and I pasted them on frame by frame <laughs> just so we could use the footage. This was horrendous. It was the worst time in development. But I was so committed to making sure we could have that footage. And um, basically, um, this is being filmed, but I kind of told Nintendo we just reshot it. and. Yeah, it went through, it's fine. But if you look closely at the trailer, you can see like, the, the little things are kind of shaking around a little bit. But um, yeah, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. Um, another thing, I say we learned, we sort of knew this already, but this can't be reiterated enough. Like, even a small scope game is going to take longer than you think to finish it. 
it really felt like when we started this, it was only a few sort of months after we started that the game felt really, really like quite finished already. But then, like a year later, um, after like sort of polishing and tweaking and other sort of stuff, you sort of look back and you think, what have I been doing for a year? How far has it really moved? And it's only when you take a look at an older build that you realise you've done so much polishing and so much work, but it's really hard to see sometimes. And you kind of tend to front load development games anyway. You get all the big sweeping gameplay kind of things done really early. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that isn't development work as well when you're working towards release, which kind of eat into time. Um, but yeah, that polish is just so worth it. You've got to put the time in there because it makes everything feel so much better. And the other thing I realised kind of early on in the game when I knew I was going to be doing most of the work myself was at least try and get some help from somewhere. somewhere. So we got some help. Um, I've got good friends who do really good music. They offered to do the music for this game. I did it for the first game. And their music's way better than mine, so that was a no-brainer. Um, QA, we just got like friends and family, anyone we could just get in to come and play the game at any point, and expos as well. Localization, because everything wanted to be, we're releasing in Europe, it had to be English, French, Italian, German, Spanish. Um, we just got friends. and. As many people as we could find, shouting out on Facebook, on Twitter, whoever could help us translate it. Now, I think it works. No one's complained, but you know, it could be really poorly translated. But that's fine. But really, you get as much help as you can. So, yeah, that's the other thing. Like, except some shit goes wrong, and sometimes there is literally nothing you can do about it. Um, I could have done something about the wrist strap thing. What I couldn't do was. Um, time it any worse than I did. So at the time I was fixing all the wrist straps, this was our house. We decided to gut it and kind of, you know, do it all up in time for the baby. So I wasn't even at home. I was living with my sister-in-law sleeping in her, like, living room on a sofa bed and trying to fix a trailer that I made a horrendous mistake on. It was a horrible time. But shit goes wrong and you just get through it. Um, so yeah, what happened? We, we launched and when we finished again, that was great. And that was in March 2016 in Europe, May in North America. Um, and we had a baby in August. So this was a real bit of a, nothing that we could avoid, but you know, we didn't have any time or money to market it. I really wish that we had a bit of time after the game. It really worked well for the first game where we could spend a bit of time post-launch going around and showing it off and kind of doing tweaks. Like we took the feedback from the first game and amended it really quickly to the first patch. I didn't have time to do any of that with this one, and I think it kind of damaged it. But the other thing was, we were really quite close to the end of the Wii U life cycle. And again, nothing we could do about this. We, we had no idea when we started out that the Wii U would have a shorter lifespan. Um, it became quite apparent quickly, sort of halfway through the short life cycle of the Wii U. Um, but we couldn't do anything about our release date. We needed to get out on something, otherwise, because I've just had two years of being a stay-at-home dad, not making games. We had to get the game out. So it ended up being right at the end of the Wii U's life cycle, and that was it. But despite all that, you know, success? There was some elements of success, but uh, definitely. Personally, I, you know, made a Wii U game. I've always wanted to release a game on Nintendo, and I did it. You know, one person in a shed at the bottom of my garden. So that was kind of cool. And we got some, I was going to say, pretty good views. Some weren't great, 6.8, but they get better, 7.5. That's 3.5, that's a 7, and 8. So, I'm quite happy with that. They're not tens, but I wasn't expecting them. And we had a class of school children, primary school children, use our game as review writing practice, which was adorable. It really was. I don't know how many stars it is. I think that's more than ten. So. <laughs> <laughs> is it ten? Oh, I really can't count. But that might get added to the Metacritic. I really <laughs> hope so. <laughs> and what next? Well now I've got a bit more time to look at more platforms. Steam is definitely coming and probably Xbox One and Switch as well we're looking for. Um, but we treated the Wii U kind of as a soft launch and we can now push stuff that we didn't have time to get in there um, into these future versions. And that's it. Thank you. Because we're such a tiny company, they weren't that kind of interested in having us launch. I think they wanted to have a very select few titles to start with. 
and I haven't been speaking to them enough because I've just been busy doing other things. I want to get it ready for them, and then we are going to show, like, give them a, a demo of it so they can look at it. But hopefully that helps. You know, it goes in our favour having released something on there before. They certainly know that we can finish a game anyway. Yeah, talked a lot about sort of time frames. I'm yes. just wondering, from start to finish, how long was it? Start to finish, I think um, it was 91 days. It was just under sort of two years. Yeah. There was other bits of life happening in between then, obviously, but it was pretty much kind of two years. How do you go about testing a massive, no, massive multiplayer, a multiplayer game with like two people? Yeah, it's really tough because it's also it's mostly me, and I'm not an octopus, so I can only <laughs> hold so many controllers. I right. do not have nine limbs. Yeah. I did do stuff with my feet quite often, <laughs> um, but mostly it was like expos were so valuable for that sort of thing because they were really sort of the only kind of place that you can get that many people regularly playing your game. Um, and we took it regularly to the um, computer museum as well here. Uh, we did a lot of family gaming nights, and lots of kids playing, and kids are the best testers because they like mash buttons and. Well, I mean, they did break that controller screen a lot, but uh, you know, that's what you get. You code better. That's what I should have done. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.